I'm Chris Stuchko, co-host of the Ninth Grade Experience Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of My Ed Tech Life. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful Saturday morning, wherever in the world you may be. It may be well into Sunday. It may be Saturday evening, but thank you so much for making My Ed Tech Life a part of your day today. And I am really excited about today's guests, but or today's guest, I should say. But uh, before we get to that, as always, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for making My Ed Tech Life what it is today. I really appreciate all the kind words, the messages, the shares. Uh, we're trying to do our best. And as you know, our mission is to connect educators and creators one show at a time. So thank you so much for all your kind words and reviews. And again, I'm really excited about today's chat because uh, this educator, Stephanie, this wonderful educator who is also an amazing content creator, really caught my eye and my attention really as I was scrolling through TikTok. I mean, I, I consider myself fairly new to TikTok, even though I had an account for a while, but never really dove in. But I kind of fell into this side of TikTok, the teacher TikTok, and seeing, you know, teachers really express themselves about certain issues that are happening and just being not like outright outspoken without just, you know, hey, I'm just giving you back what you're giving. But really educated responses that even for myself as an educator for 16 years, I continue to learn. So I'm just really excited and I'm really thankful for Stephanie to be able to find some time to join us. So Stephanie, how are you doing this morning? Oh, I am doing fantastic. As you can see, I have the um, Croatia-Morocco game on. Um, in the background, low-key, I'm going to be peeking at the reflection <laughs> while we're talking. Um, I'm I'm doing awesome. This is the first day of Christmas break. And oh. That, so I had, an, I had a lovely send off with my students yesterday and I'm just feeling great. I'm missing them already. Um, that's that is great. Thing. That's wonderful that you're already on break. I, we still have a two and a half days. We have Monday, Tuesday, half day, Wednesday, and then we go ahead and start our break. But that's wonderful. I'm glad you've already made it to break. Some a little time to unplug and recharge, like you said, and just get ready for the new year. And of course, you know, the remainder of the school year. So that's great. So, Stephanie, before we get started and diving in into the conversation, we're going to talk about, obviously, your story. You have such a wonderful story, and I love the way that you advocate for, uh, you know, students. But before we get to that, if you could just give us a brief introduction and your context in education for all our audience members who are getting to meet you today for their first time. Yes, this is so exciting, and thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, I'm Stephanie LaFaro. I go by Ms. Lowe in the classroom. Um, and I, uh, this is my first semester, basically, in a, in a public school. I came from um, teaching the GED program for adults, and I had some awesome experiences where I would have um, whole family groups in at one time. Um, and that was really interesting to kind of tutor, um, you know, new uh, English language learners, basically, um, whole family groups. And that was such a cool experience. Um, I've also um, started to, uh, tutoring the GED program in prisons and jails as well. Um, and that was what got me very interested in public education because I, you know, the, a buzzword of mine is that school to prison pipeline. Um, and once you kind of see it and experience it, it feels real, even though people don't believe it. Um, and that was kind of what sparked my interest in like, oh, maybe I need to go into the classroom and kind of little old me, just, you know, one one student at a time, just try to prevent that from happening. So Awesome. You know, that's wonderful. And we'll get into that because I've had another um, guest, uh, you know, a couple several shows back, Andre Dottie. And also the same thing. He has, you know, a keynote and he does presentations on like you mentioned, like, you know, school or the prison pipeline. And so that's very interesting to get your perspective and working with adults. Uh, so now, I like I said, I always like to get started with the origin story. So everybody that I invite here to me is somebody that's equivalent, honestly, to like a superhero, somebody that I follow. And as you know, every superhero has an origin story. So I'm curious to know and know a little bit more about the Stephanie LaFaro origin story. 
So my question to you is you can go as far back as you like, maybe through your experience in, in education, but really I want to know is education, you know, and going into the, you know, the adult uh, classes that you're teaching and GED, was education something you always thought that you would end up doing or was it something that you kind of fell into and then just absolutely just blossomed from there? So tell us a little bit about your origin story. That is a great question because it's a little bit of both. I had always had in the back of my mind, like, oh, I want to be a teacher because even when I was, you know, five or six or seven years old, I was like, this has to change. Like something just didn't settle with me in school. Like it just didn't feel natural to me. Um, and it just never felt like a place I wanted to, like wanted to spend my time. Um, but that, you know, the legality of school, like you just have to go there and you have to get in line and you have to sit, you have to take your seat and you have to listen to the teacher. That's it. Um, but you know, from so from a very young age, like it just didn't settle with me. And it it showed throughout high school. Um, I wasn't identified as a struggling learner until I was 11 years old. Um, and I knew by then that I was falling behind, but my results still kind of carried me through. And so I was one of those learners that slipped under the rug. Um, and I think it showed up a lot more in my behavior. Um, and so I was tagged as, you know, that troubled kid. And that is one label that I can't stand because behaviors are just a symptom. Um, and they always will be. Um, not saying that behaviors are always learning disabilities, but in my case, it was like I didn't know how to express the areas where I was struggling um, until until I got to sit down, you know, with an educational psychologist not too long ago, like recently, um, I went back for my adult reevaluation and she helped make a lot of sense into what, what I was going through as a young child. So there was a lot of like educational, um, I hate saying the word trauma because people are like, oh, school's not traumatic. Um, just hear me out. Um, it can be. <laughs> so, um, but yes, a lot of like educational it's, I'll say, um, that just carried through and Croatia just scored. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, you know, like you said, I, I would really like if you, you know, maybe let us know just a little bit more about that experience. And the only reason, again, just as far and as much as you like to share, because honestly, I feel that after coming back, there was just kind of like a shift, uh, just in, sometimes, you know, even now, like, teachers seem to be more on edge. I know that there's more that's coming down, but even in my 16 years of education and even prior to pandemic, there were still some things, you know, like you mentioned, you know, maybe some students that were not, let's say, identified maybe with having, you know, uh, maybe something like dyslexia and seeing like, oh, they're just hard, you know, they can't learn, they can't do this. And the language that I always hear or often hear is like, oh, well, that's not my kid. That's their kid, you know, and that's coming from the tier one instruction. Uh, teachers, is that something that you yourself, you know, felt, you know, growing up, you know, what were some of the things that you went through and how that kind of motivated you? Because as you know, the title here is like overcoming dyslexia and then struggling student to master's degree. So what were some of maybe if you pinpoint a couple of things that going through and then just saying, you know what, I'm going to do this and I'm going to just show you what we can do or what I can do? Um, oh, gosh, yeah, there were um, so many moments where, you know, a teacher would kind of take me aside or we'd have a one on one where the teacher would show me an example of really good work that I would do. And they would be very explicit with like, this is what I expect from you. And this is, you know, what I need. Um, where is this in all of the other work that you do? Um, and I think the biggest thing is accommodations and time. Like I'm not someone that can sit down in a class for 45 minutes and produce good work because my processing time isn't there. Um, and I think a lot of teachers kind of expect so much with so little time from our kids. Um, and, you know, I actually do. I want to plug. I have to be careful with the words that I say, because sometimes I'm like, oh, teachers do this and teachers do that. Um, and I have been kind of commented on for assuming that I'm blaming teachers for this when really like I'm talking from experience and as a struggling student the teacher is the one in front of you and that's where I'm coming from so 
when I have all this experience and I want to, you know, sometimes I, I say things that are just from experience, but they sound like I am like, oh, the, the teacher is attacking me. So people kind of say like, oh, teachers aren't to blame. And I, I know that. I know that. Um, that is just what I experienced. And it's just, I know now working in the system, obviously, there's a lot more at that play. Yeah. Uh, and so teachers really do. Um, I, I want to say that I, I know a whole ton of teachers that will show up as their best selves in their classroom. Rightly so. We all do. Um, and there's just so little that we can actually do to change the system. Yeah, you know, and you're absolutely right. You know, there's a lot of changes that need to take place just to make things a lot easier. But I, I like what you said, you know, uh, there's a lot to be expected with such little time. So oh, yeah. it's like that really adds to everything and adds to the pressure and adds to, you know, just having to move on because you have to finish curriculum. You have to worry about state testing. You have to worry about in between testing, like benchmarks and yeah. you have little mini assessments in between. And it's like, it just seems like every other week, it's like a mini assessment, you know, data point and it's just test, 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 test. And it's like, wow, you know, so uh, yeah, that, that kind of takes a lot of time and adds a lot of pressure to really, you know, making the, the class, you know, hands on, making it very engaging. Um, you know, it's very similar to a little bit of what we were talking in the pre-chat, you know, it seems like your classroom. Um, oh, and we'll talk about the, the coding because I do want to congratulate you on that too as well as I know that you are a recipient, you know, of $10,000, you know, from code.org. And so we're, we'll get into that work that you're doing. So, you know, now again, we're talking about your, you know, going and getting your master's degree. So where did that itch come from? Because I know you said you were working with adult uh, and adult learners. Where did that spark? And you say, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to go ahead and get my master's in education and, you know, just continue working in education. Oh, cool. So a little bit of a fork in the road. So after I was a GED and ESL instructor, I um, moved into a corporate role. It, again, I just kind of got itchy feet and I was like, I need um, I need a, a much more steady income. So, you know, GED teaching, you have to just kind of do what you make of it. Um, and so I ended up in a corporate role and I was um, on an IT help desk. Um, I just worked my way up for six years and I ended up as the director. And after two years in my director role, um, I realized that a lot of what I was doing was training my staff. Um, again, like educating and training. <laughs> and so I was like, this is this is what I know. And I love tech and I love computer science but I still ended up in this like educator mindset and so I was like this is where I need to be and so I was really sad to leave my last job um but it just happened I just um had to do something and when COVID hit especially um we all went remote I ended up doing a lot of virtual teaching um and Again, again, it just felt like a natural path for me. And Colorado State University was very close by. So I was like, let's let's just do this and see what happens. Um, because, again, going back to school wasn't something that I necessarily thought I could conquer. But it felt so natural to me that it was something that, I, oh gosh, I can't explain it. I just did it. <laughs> it's, very, it's very strange. Um, maybe I will I'll try to kind of verbalize how I feel about that. <laughs> no, yeah, no worries. And, and like I said, you know, you can see that I think probably as you were, you know, doing your ESL class, so you did the corporate job. And like you said, a lot of it dealt with instructing, teaching yep. your staff. And I think probably that's where the bug came from too as well. And, uh, you know, moving it into and getting your master's. So now I know, you know, when I ran, when I ran into your account on TikTok, I think you were still doing your master's and you were posting things about your master's and you're working on your final assignments and papers and so on. So now going back to, you know, the experience that you had, you know, in, in let's say K through 12 and then going back into school, what were some of the differences or what were some of the things that you now were, okay, you know, this is what I'm going to go ahead and do. You know, I know that there's a, a lot of things that, you know, come down in the, those master's courses what were some of the ways that you were able to overcome, you know, like we're talking about just the dyslexia and to be able to just move through those courses? 
Right. Um, so I would also like to plug that my master's program is the first program where I have maintained a straight A student. Um, when I don't want to say I graduated high school because I actually left high school, I didn't meet the requirements to graduate when I was 18. Um, and it was something that I didn't really consider at the time because, um, gosh, I don't know. I wasn't educationally mind. I didn't have that bug yet. Um, <laughs> yet I did in a different, a very different way. Um, and, oh, the question one more time. Oh, yeah. No, just, so, uh, you know, going into, you know, the master's program and then, of course, you know, maybe some of that confidence not being there from the K-12 experience and now jumping in to something that's like very intense, you know, because a lot of these courses, there's a lot of studying, a lot of reading, a lot of writing. So what were some yeah. of the things there that you felt were maybe just kind of like, oh, man, am I making the right choice? Or you said, you know what? I got this. Let's do this. <laughs> OK, perfect. Yes. Um, so. I think in the, gosh, in the master's level, like we get a lot of choice in our coursework. Um, and so I, I didn't know that at the time because after um, I, I did spend seven years getting my bachelor's degree, that was another kind of plug. Um, and again, it was very much like you sit and get at the bachelor's level. But when you get to your master's level, you get so much more freedom in the areas that you want to research. And um, that definitely helped because if it's something that you're like very interested in, which is for me, it was like, I want to be that teacher. I want to be the change. Um, I was able to tailor my own master's program to, you know, my, my plug, which is overcoming dyslexia. Uh, and that was obviously something that I'm very knowledgeable about. I have the experience. Um, and once I started producing work that was in that, that I was interested in, um, I just, you know, you just kind of find your flow after a while. Um, and it, it's different in research. Like you just kind of, I don't know how to explain it. You, you find your flow and then you just go. <laughs> so, there you go. No, yeah. and, you know, one thing that I love that you mentioned though, and I didn't experience that. Well, yeah, I experienced it a little bit in my master's program because Again, it, it, they gave you choice. And like you said, if it's something that you're really, you know, interested in, you're able to work on those projects. And even now, even in my doctoral studies, there's one professor that was wonderful that she kind of just kind of got outside the box and said, you know what, guys, this semester, I'm going to give you a choice board. And as long as you have 21 contact hours here, but you can either do 10 hours of a conference, you can come to all my lectures instead. You can do a book study, you can watch a movie and, or, and then in my case, cause there wasn't my option. I, I raised my hand there in the zoom session. I said, can I do a podcast? They're like, sure, go ahead and do a podcast. But what was interesting was all my classmates, their eyes were like deer in the headlights because it's like, what do you mean? I don't understand. Like I get a like choice board, like, no, no, like just tell me what I need to do because that's what I'm going to turn in. And we had probably a 30 minute conversation because there was still like, like, I don't get it. I don't understand. And so that's very interesting because it just seems like coming in from K through 12 and getting into, you know, uh, higher ed also, it's just, we're programmed to just tell me what I need to do and submit for the yep. best grade or minimum grade. And then when you kind of open things up, it's kind of like, whoa, what just happened? The rug got pulled from under me and I don't understand what you're saying. And what I've been thinking about lately is what if we took this model that's in the higher ed space and move it to K-12 and really just give a little bit more choice as far as how the students present their work? Because I found a lot of success at the, the lower grade levels, allowing students to present their learning in very different modalities that they feel comfortable with. But as long as they met what my rubric was, I was, they're good. So, but, yep. so I love that experience that you had. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yes. And I am certainly on board with that. I um, am very lucky to teach computer science electives and I do that for seven, eight and ninth and 11th grade. Um, my 11th graders, I, but I copy the AP computer science curriculum and bring it down one notch. Um, and I, sometimes I don't even bring it down a notch. They can handle it. They they do it. 
Um, but my seventh, eighth, and ninth graders, I always give them a choice. Um, we are engineers. When you come into my classroom, you're engineers. Yes, it's computer science, but consider it STEM. Like we are at STEAM even. So you can do computer aided design. I give them a choice of three um, uh, three final projects that they can do. Um, they can either build a website, which shows me that they can code in HTML and CSS. Um, you can build an app, which is JavaScript, um, or you can 3D print a tool. Uh, the tool has to be something that they can use in real life, and it has to come with a written statement of purpose. And I've had students print a whistle um, that they used in for the soccer team. So they 3D printed a whistle. Um, I've had a student print a spoon because she always brings noodles to my class and she always asks me for cutlery. And I was like, hey, why don't you make your own cutlery? Um, and so I set her up with, you know, the 3D print tool. And it takes a really long time. You have to be really intricate in the design studio, um, just like you are with coding and HTML. So again, it's like it comes down to this like engineering mindset. Um, and you put on your engineer hat and you follow this design process. It doesn't matter what you build, but you have to follow the process. Uh, and that's what I grade on. And they love it. And I love it. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That sounds so great. So I want to talk a little bit more about that because, you know, this is tech and I know that this is something that you're passionate about too, and I can hear it. But, you know, like you said, so you do multiple grade levels, yep. you have a curriculum, you either you know, bring it down or just kind of leave it the same depending on the, the level of students. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about you, you know, going from adults and, you know, teaching adults and now going into teaching in the classroom. What were some of the, man, I wish somebody would have told me this first moments that you experienced? Yeah. Um. Oof. Well, I think one of them was, again, acknowledging my own, like, privilege and my own whiteness, I have to say, um, because I did come from, you know, middle class family and I had all the opportunities, um, struggled through them, but I had the opportunities. And um, I guess I was just blind as to how many of us don't have those opportunities. Um, and I think once my eyes started opening to that, it was like, well, I'm in a place where I can actually stand up and do something about this. Um, and that was what really lit a fire under my butt and got me going. Um, and oof, I just, I see, <laughs> I see so much of myself in all of the students that I teach um, <laughs> that I just, I, I can't stop now. It's just, you, you meet somebody and you, you fall in love with them and you want to see them succeed. That's great, you know, and that's the thing that I love too that you mentioned, and uh, you know, I talked about it a little bit in the pre-chat that, you know, as I was going through your social media and going to what you were saying here, like you said, you know, oftentimes when we find ourselves in within our students and say, oh man, I remember that, or I I can see a little bit of me in that, and so on, it kind of helps you adjust a little bit, and it kind of helps you really just show some compassion and some empathy and just yeah. be there, and then of course. Like you said, you know, you want to make the change. And now that you're in a position where you can make some change happen, you're definitely willing to do it and go all out. So I'm just really excited about that. So talk to me about just like I said, that that quote that I saw you put up, um, you know, as far as referencing, I want to be the teacher that I needed when I was in school. So how does that, how has that helped you shape your classroom community? Oh, cool. So one specific moment that I remember was a French teacher um, and she would always grill me for not making eye contact. Um, and <laughs> I just remember this thing where teachers actually I was trained to do this by my leadership, which is like one, two, three eyes on me. And like, like that doesn't work for high school. Like it just doesn't work for high school. Like stop making me do that in my classroom. Uh, <laughs> but yes. OK, so an attention getter but doesn't have to be that like Ooh, like one, two, three eyes on me because you can listen and look over here. And I don't know if you've noticed, but when you're talking on this podcast, I'm kind of looking down, I'm playing with my hands. Um, I am just, God, I'm, I'm processing. That's what I'm really doing. Um, and a lot of teachers don't see that because they don't have that kind of neurodivergent lens. Um, and that's all I'm trying to do is just like spread awareness. Um, and so that one French teacher that I was talking about, um, 
gosh, I hope she's doing well. Um, but she had a really hard time with my older brother too. Um, and I think, I think it was a little bit, um, Madame, Madame Derry. Um, yes, she hated me. Um, but she didn't, she, had, she did not fail me because there was one word or so that I was able to pronounce like correctly and I did it very well. Um, and so she wouldn't fail me. Um, but it's just remembering all those little tiny things that I was dinged for in school. I'm, I'm not going to ding my kids for those little things too, because I had good intentions that were just perceived the wrong way. Like yeah. I, when I'm looking at the floor, I'm, and you know, playing with my wedding ring, I'm really glad that I have this as like a fidget. Um, it really means that I care and I'm paying attention, but people don't see that. People yeah. just think that I'm looking at the floor because I'm not interested. Um, and so having that kind of lens is, is what I'm trying to bring into the classroom is a norm. It's like, we shouldn't be, shouldn't be taking points away from a student for looking at the floor or staring at the ceiling. Um, that's yeah, right. no, I, I agree with that. Like, you know what you're saying. And I think for myself, you know, work going from business, um, you know, business background and then going into education was something for me was really the customer service experience. So I, I don't know if maybe for a while, because I did not go through the traditional um, college of education or really do any, you know, education studies, it was really business, but they're like, Hey, you have enough hours to be a math teacher. So we're going to put you in a math classroom, mind yeah. you with no teaching experience, but the customer service lens really lends itself to classroom because the way that I was able to learn or excuse me, learn how to teach or at least help my students feel comfortable was really understanding that I have 27 customers that I have to sell algebra to and not everybody's going to buy it the same way. So I have to adjust. I have to improvise. I have to adapt to their learning styles. And I think that that was one of the biggest things that's helped me even transition from high school to elementary when I did that. For, I did elementary for eight years. I did high school for three years. And really that, that was the experience and it's always been the experience is really customer service and really, you know, understanding that, you know, students, they all come from different backgrounds. They may all process differently. And I think that's something that we tend to forget because again, going back to what we talked about, we have to do so much in so little time that we don't get, have or give enough processing time, enough time for discourse and dialogue. Uh, you know, for to have students to be able to verbalize, to have students to be able to create, to have students to be able to internalize conversations because it's go, 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 go. So I love that you are doing that for your students and it makes a world of a difference because I bet and I'm willing to bet, you know, coming into your classroom, they it, it, they're very different. It's a place for them where they can kind of relax, not saying that they're not doing any work, but just yeah. feel comfortable. <laughs> you know so that's yeah. huge yeah and I think that's the biggest part that I want to emphasize is that I want my students to feel comfortable first because that's where authentic learning actually happens um they can sit down and copy notes from the board and you don't see real learning um but when I'm circulating and I hear the discussions it's just again like I'm just like oh, I'm doing the right thing okay I can like I've got it <laughs> like, oh. That's yeah. great. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, code.org. Please tell us what that was all about because, of course, this is the Maya Tech Life podcast. So we got to throw some tech in there. So tell us a little bit about what uh, it all took place, at, you know, in order for you to receive mm -hmm. this wonderful grant from code.org. Yeah. So I, uh, so code.org is a beautiful platform. I'm going to do a quick plug. Um, this is not sponsored. Um, I just love their computer science curriculum. Um, I, you know, being a first year public school teacher, I was like, oh, I have AP now, so I'm going to need a curriculum. Um, so, you know, I bought all the prep guides. I looked through, spent the summer like, yes, OK, I know the content. Obviously, I was hired for a reason. Um, <laughs> don't panic. I <laughs> just needed lesson plans and I needed, you know, the. I needed the, the teacher thing, <laughs> you know, to do, because, um, again, I came from straight from that corporate job. Um, and they provided an entire year long computer science curriculum. 
Um, and it, it is fantastic. I often take their lessons, um, will kind of differentiate and modify them a little bit where I need to, um, but they have the brick and mortar for the AP computer science curriculum. And um, it's fairly new in my network. So my district is 14 schools um, and I have this little club of computer science teachers in our schools. Um, only half of us use that curriculum. And so I was like, okay, so I'm going to take this and kind of make it ours. Um, and I just stumbled upon code.org. They had a prize going for teachers and they were like, what are your plans for expanding computer science in your school? Um, that was the entire prize. And they were like, show us what you um, plan to do in the next school year and we'll give you 10K. And so I was like, this is perfect. Like I'm going to, I'm going to submit my uh, proposal and it was to take a code.org um, course. Uh, so I'm already using the computer science principles course and I wanted to take their computer science discoveries course. Um, I will link everything in my TikTok uh, profile for everyone who's interested. Um, and I also have it all on Teachers Pay Teachers, which is free. So it's TPT, but all of my stuff is free. Um, that is aligned with code.org and I'm, I'm blabbering. Um, but anyway, they had that competition to take a code.org course, um, show how you're going to use it in the 2023-2024 school year um, and submit it. Um, and so I did that with their computer science discoveries course. Um, and it was just like uh, showing code.org how I'm going to implement their computer science discoveries course and their hour of code um, club. And it was just a Google form that was linked out of code.org and I submitted it. I had my school leadership submit a letter of support. Um, one school in every state um, ended up with the prize money. And for Colorado, yours truly, <laughs> it was really cool. Um, it happened in, so fast. And I just submitted the form and I was like, okay, you know, it's one of those things where you submit it and you don't think anything's going to happen. Um, two weeks later, I hear from my principal before code.org and she's like, Stephanie, like, check your email, check your email. And I was like, what is it? What is it? What did I do? Did I miss a meeting? Oh God, am I in trouble? Um, <laughs> no, I won 10K. I was like, wow. <laughs> like it was, it was such a cool experience. And then I got connected to code.org, um, on social media and, you know, I met their, um, outreach manager and he's fantastic. I can't wait for him to come to the school. Um, it's the first time I'm ever going to hold a big prop check. Um, going to go up in my classroom forever. And I'm, I'm so glad I just, it was again, happened so fast. And, um, you know, that's yeah. great. That's wonderful. You know, and, you know, I'm a huge advocate of, you know, coding or, you know, programming and, you know, all, all those tools. I mean, grow, growing up, yeah, I, I loved to tinker. We lived in a, yep. in kind of like a citrus farm sort of so that we lived there. My dad worked there. And so they had a shop that was open and I would just go into that shop and that all the workers were out, you know, on the tractors, they were out on the fields and everything, doing the citrus stuff and everything. But I would sneak in there and I'd just be like tinkering and everything. I'm glad I never, you know, lost a limb or a finger or anything because I was always playing with the saws and tinkering. But you know, I, when I moved into elementary, I was able to bring that, like you said, and that enthusiasm with the coding and programming. And I oftentimes think that many, uh, you know, underestimate what a young student can do when you just put some of these tools right before them. And uh, one of the things that helped me was I, I wasn't the expert at the tool, but I wanted to introduce it and I would introduce what I knew. But it was amazing to see what the students were able to teach me. So what I loved is that when I would introduce it in the morning to my class, by the end of the day, I looked like the expert because I was learning from every class. And I thought that that was something that's wonderful and great. So I love the fact that you're really pushing, you know, or the fact that your district really is really pushing uh, computer science because that's something that is wonderful. And there's so many jobs that are out there. And then, you know, now that you have some great resources with those $10,000 to be able to get and really equip either your lab and, you know, bring more programs or, you know, speakers or anything like that. I think your students are definitely benefit greatly from that. So what are some of the things, you know, as far as computer science, you know, if you can tell us just from your experience, because there might be some computer science teachers or maybe somebody that would be interested in computer science. I know you said you did, I think it was what, seventh, eighth and ninth grade? Yep. Yep. Okay. And, and 12th. 
and 12th grade. So yeah. what are some of the things, you know, being your first year teaching, you know, maybe some of the best advice that you would give when starting, um, you know, a program like this or really diving in into a program where you might have to work with multiple grade levels? Oof. So, um, this was a really tough one. And honestly, I don't think I'm the best person to be giving advice to uh, be giving advice to, um, because I'm still learning as I do this. Um, I, again, I came from adult learning as well. And so I naturally um, was, I, I would say, better suited for my 12th and 11th grade classes. Um, and I'm Honestly, I'm still learning how to be a middle school teacher. It is tough. Um, props to all the middle school teachers out there who bring us the students that we get in high school. Um, because, oh gosh, my high schoolers are bussing, no cap. <laughs> um, but then we have to thank our middle school teachers because they are the ones that trained our high schoolers. Um, and I think my best advice as a, as a teacher talking to other teachers is to stay teachable um stay teachable i love that i think that's something that is wonderful that you know going back to that stay teachable stay be coachable that's yep. something that's very uh that's some sound advice and i really appreciate that and that's something that i'm seeing actually from a lot of the first year teachers that are coming in and not just in my district but in other districts is just that they're remain very coachable and they come in and they're willing to take that advice and, you know, continue to grow and to learn. And, you know, like I always said, what I did is, I mean, I learned so much from my high school teachers and things that I learned in high school, I was able to implement when I became all of a sudden from high school going down to sixth grade. So I was dealing with ninth graders uh, going to sixth grade to sixth grade. And then I was like, well, there isn't too much of a difference, you know, other than the age, you know, the kind of the behavior is a little bit the same, but I kind of had to adjust. But it was just that, like adapting to my yeah. customers and knowing that and learning from high school, sprinkling on some of the great things that I learned there, but then also learning from my colleagues in those grade levels and then moving down to fifth. And then sometimes what happens is I move to a different school. So now you're learning a different style because from school to school, there's different cultures, different ways. Yeah. So it's great to just still be coachable and still be able to learn. And I think that's something that's important because at the end of the day, we're going to benefit professionally, but also the students are just going to benefit greatly from that as well. So I lo absolutely love that. So as as far as, uh, again, going back to your computer science class, um, you know, you said you do a lot of stuff with uh, 3D printing and so on. And so now that we talked a little bit about some of the projects that you did, I know I want to dive in a, a, just a little bit deeper, uh, you know, as far as your classroom, as far as, uh, you know, curriculum wise assessments are a lot of your assessments just project based. Um, you know, how do you handle that in your classrooms, depending like from grade level to grade level? Oh, yeah. So uh, the good thing about Code.org is that they provide rubrics for all of their um, final projects. Um, and in my AP class, you know, there's uh, clear standards that they have to meet. Um, it's all logged in my AP classroom. Um, and that's where they do most of their assessments. Um, and a lot of, oof. Okay. So I love, I love my formatives. I do a lot of formatives at the beginning of the year. Um, so that, you know, I can go back and update those grades when they crush a summative. Um, at the end of the year, and they show me that they actually mastered it. Um, I will go back and update, you know, that beginning of the year grade, um, which is what I believe formatives are for. Um, it's to, you know, show gr ongoing growth. Um, and yes, a lot of it is um, rubrics, rubric based. Um, is this something that actually meets the purpose that you defined at the beginning of the trimester or the beginning of the year? Um, did you meet your own project goal? Um, I think with my elective classes, I'm a little bit more flexible with how I grade that. Um, is this something that you were proud of? Um, a lot of like self-reflecting um, goes into their final grade. Um, and that that's really important too. It's like giving them a chance to speak up, even if they, you know, did not meet that rubric. Like, why didn't you meet it? What is, what would be something that you're changed? Like, I take that into account as well. Um, I love yeah. that. I love that, you know, and just the fact, you know, and it's so funny that you mentioned rubrics because this last semester in my curriculum transformation class, we, the, our professor was like, oh yeah, it, 
it turned out coincidentally that it was the same topic I was researching, but she said, you know what, this semester for curriculum transformation, you're going to find something that is either trending or an idea or something that you think that can help uh, the education system. And so my thing right away was ungrading because I was a big fan of ungrading when I was in the classroom and everything was done with rubrics. So now that you mentioned that, it really does give the students the ability to reflect. And I absolutely agree that I think that's something that is so powerful because oftentimes when you give an assessment, it's like, all right, here's your grade. They're like, okay, great. I got an 80. I passed. Yep. That's it. They just grab that paper, shove it into the abyss that is their backpack, never to be seen again. And that's it. But with, you know, the ungrading process, it's really you're focusing more on the learning and not so much on the grade. But I mean, they're still going to get a grade. You know, don't get me yeah. wrong. There is still a grade. But I love that reflection piece where you can dive in a little bit deeper and just really either guide them along the way as, as far as learning how to self-reflect or you do have some students that really understand and just say, wow, like I, I didn't realize this. And they start really opening up and just really growing from that. So those are some of the things that I love. I just want to give a shout out to Amanda Macias who's joining us. And I love this comment that she says, Amanda Macias says, there's a myth that adults and children learn differently. In reality, it's all learning about how we learn best. So big shout out to Amanda. Thank you so much for your support. Yeah. I really appreciate it Absolutely. and joining the show. All right. Well, Stephanie, it has been just an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. And again, I'm very honored because as I told you earlier, pre-chat, I was like, oh my gosh, I have somebody that's TikTok famous on my show because I stumbled onto your account and I love the work that you're doing. I've been sharing your uh, social media accounts throughout the show. And of course, they'll go on the show notes. But if you'd like, please make sure you plug away. You know, is there a way uh, that uh, our audience members would be able to reach you and maybe, you know, again, just rem remind them about those resources that you might have available to them? Oh, yes. So my website, stephanielafaro.com, um, just like my name, uh, no spaces.com. Um, it's still in process, but it is available. It's open. Um, I have lesson plans on there. I have. Um, a lot of dyslexia resources as well. Uh, again, most of it is just like from my experience um, and a lot of the research that I did in grad school. Um, I'm also on Teachers Pay Teachers. Again, just STEM teacher staff or Comp Sci Teach um, on Twitter. If you search anything on Teachers Pay Teachers, I will probably show up. Um, all of my resources for AP Computer Science are free. Um, and actually, all of my resources on TPT uh, are all free. Um, and I also want to say, Fonz, I was a little bit starstruck coming on here <laughs> um, because um, I, I'm accidental famous on TikTok. <laughs> I'm not even famous. I'm just accidentally TikTok famous. Um, but your My EdTech Life podcast is the real deal. That's what's famous. <laughs> um, and so I was starstruck. Oh, well, thank um, you, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. You know, like I said, and of course, you know, I, I, I'm glad that we were able to find time because I'm all about this. This is really my, what my passion is and what I love to do. And the, really the mission of the show is that organically turned into this is just to have some wonderful, delightful, great hearted, you know, teachers such as yourself and educators to amplify their voice and the amazing work that you're doing. But one thing I do want to say, too, is I want to thank you for just also being very open in, you know, about your experience, you know, K through 12. And then, of course, being able to overcome the, uh, you know, that going into your master's program. And now, you know, you're bringing such great energy into your classroom. And I'm just really excited and delighted to see your success. I'm delighted to see things from your lens, your perspective, and of course, the, the benefit that that's going to bring to your classroom culture, your community and your students. And, you know, that definitely your, your school is very lucky to have you. Your kids are very lucky to have you. So I'm just really excited about that. So Stephanie, before we wrap up, this is uh, the last segment of the show and we always end with three questions. So my first question to you would be is this, in the current state of education, what would you say is your current edu kryptonite? My edu kryptonite. Um, ooh. The idea of pedagogy. So in my master's degree, I learned about the adult side of pedagogy, which is andragogy. Um, the concepts of andragogy are just human needs, um, not necessarily adult needs. 
And so I would say pedagogy is my adult kryptonite because pedagogy doesn't cover how humans learn. Um, I, I know. Love that. I know. That, that <laughs> yeah. is a great answer. I love that. No, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm not going to say anything. We, I did have a class <laughs> yeah. on that where we mm -hmm. talked about that and I was like, mm -hmm, yeah. So no, mm -hmm. great answer. Thank you. All right. Next question. If you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? Um, it would be dyslexia, bringing the sexy back into dyslexia. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. That is great. I love it. That is wonderful. I love it. That's very creative. And of course, I know that that's a lot of what you talk about on your social mm -hmm. media, on TikTok, and you're a huge advocate. And you always have some wonderful answers. And, you know, just the way that you really educate a lot of people out there. We know that there's a lot of trolls out there, but then there's a lot of people that just sincerely may be just misinformed about what is out there. But thank you so much. But I love that idea. I could just <laughs> picture that just like, you know, driving by and it's like, hey, there you go. I know who that's from. <laughs> All right. Now, last question, Stephanie. If this was the Stephanie LaFaro show and I was a guest on your podcast, what might be one question you'd like to ask me? Um, one question I would like to ask you is what inspired you to go full on doctorate? Actually, okay. What inspired me was I, my love for learning. And I know it sounds cliche. It really does. But, you know, being through the pandemic and going through a lot of this and doing, you know, you kind of learn a little bit more about yourself. And I found a page where it's like, hey, are you a multi-passionate creative? I was like, w what is this? And I started kind of going into that. And then I was like, that kind of describes the way that I'm, in, that I am, where if there's something like, I just want to have my toes in it and know and learn and everything just because I want to be, and I always tell people, I want to be ready in season and out of season. So I don't want to be caught yeah. off guard. I want to know what is out there, even if it's just, you know, the, the bare bones, but just be in familiar enough with it where if I need to dive in deeper, I can. So that really pushed me to get my master's and then for my master's straight into the doctoral program because, again, just what I can learn and bring that energy back into the K-12 space and, you know, maybe really do some transformation or at least have a seat at the table to be able to open up that dialogue and be able to open up these conversations that many may not have or fear having because we know where some of those conversations can lead. So that's my passion. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that question. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. I really appreciate you and appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And to all of our audience members that are listening, please make sure that you check out Stephanie on all her social media. She has some amazing and wonderful content. You will be able to find that in the show notes as soon as I post this show up. And as always, my friends, please make sure you visit our website at myedtech.life where you can catch this amazing episode and the other 153 episodes from amazing teachers and educators that are out there sharing their experience where you can take a listen take some of those gems, sprinkle them, sprinkle them onto what you already do great. And of course, continue to support our show just by listening, sharing, liking, and following. Or if you'd like to as well, you can go ahead and visit our My EdTech Life store where you can get yourself some sweet swag. And we've got some new designs here. And of course, some My EdTech Life merch that you can go ahead and purchase. We know that it's getting a little bit cooler. We've got some wonderful, cool seasonal attire that you can wear to lounge around or some conference wear. Whatever the case is, we thank you so much for contributing to our mission of connecting educators one show at a time. So as always, my friends, until next time, don't forget, stay techie.